Lent is a time to prepare our hearts and renew our lives. We mark this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for the mercy and forgiveness of God, which is proclaimed in the gospel. We are invited in the name of Christ to observe a holy Lent by self-examination, prayer, and fasting, works of love, and by meditating on the word of God. May the God of new life work in us, and may we receive the power and peace of divine love. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Would you please pray with me? Holy God, you are the one who liberates all people from oppression, and we are awestruck by the glory of your love and power. We are also needful of your comfort and assurance especially during these weeks of Lent that are ahead of us, a time of wandering in the wilderness. Be a companion and guide to each one of us as we continue our journey, seeking nourishment for our souls. As we sing and pray together this morning, may we rejoice at all that we see and hear. As we listen to your word proclaimed, may we marvel at your wisdom. As we worship, transform our hearts and our lives and strengthen us for the week that is ahead, whatever it may bring, through the power of your Son, Jesus, in whose wonderful name we pray. Amen. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Turn back to the Lord your God, who is gracious and compassionate, long-suffering, and abounding in love. O Lord, our God, we confess to you that we do not take the condition of our souls with the seriousness it merits. We strive to gain the whole world, even at the risk of forfeiting our souls. We do not have in mind the things of God, but earthly things. Jesus gave his life that we might gain ours, but we have come to take it for granted. Forgive us, we pray, and by your unfailing grace, turn our hearts to love you above all else. Through Christ our Lord, we pray, amen. Hear the good news of Christ. In the desert, God sustains us, sending angels to minister to us and quenching our thirst with living water. God does not will for anyone to be lost, but forgives our iniquity 
and remembers our sin no more. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Well, welcome to worship at Timothy Eaton Memorial Church this morning on the first Sunday of Lent, of the season of Lent that is ahead of us. And a welcome as well to those who are uh, worshiping on our live stream or listening on the radio this morning. We pray that this service will be a blessing to you as well. We are also, in addition to it being the first uh, Sunday of Lent, today we are recognizing uh, St. David's Day, which is actually March 1st. And St. David, of course, is the patron saint of well, Wales. And so uh, in, to, uh, in honor of our, our Welsh community that is a part of our congregation, now we're uh, recognizing this day. We have the Welsh flag. Uh, for those who were able to join us during the coffee hour, you, got, you may have enjoyed some Welsh cakes. Um, <laughs> or maybe not, because they went quickly. So um, you, you, I'm sure it won't be the last opportunity that you have to enjoy these, these special treats. But today is, is uh, we're recognizing St. David's Day. This afternoon at 4.30 in the atrium, the young adults uh, are gathering again with Nupur and Aaron for a paint night. So tonight, they, they, the young adults gathering has worship time and, and fellowship time, uh, but also some social time. And so tonight, those who are part of or want to join the young adults group will be able to enjoy paint night. On, also on March 1st is the first night of our Lent study. And so we're uh, looking at the book Sacred Pathways, Nine Ways to Connect with God uh, by Gary Thomas. And um, we have a study guide available at the welcome table. So you can get that um, today if you would like to join us. And you, are, you can join us for the Lent study either in person here at the church or online uh, via Zoom. If you want to join online especially, we will need you to register on the TEMC website because that's what, how we'll be sending out the Zoom link is to the people who have registered. So hope you'll be able to join us for that. Also, one last quick announcement for those who have been interested in the Holy Land's journey in October of this year. We're taking a group of people to uh, Jordan and Israel. We had been nearing capacity, but the demand has been um, so great. There have been so many people interested in wanting to register that we've been able to add a second bus load. So we have a whole bunch more space available for those who would like to join us. Now, because it is um, very popular, don't, don't wait. If you're interested in joining us, please do um, fill out the registration form, send in your deposit, secure your spot on the trip as soon as possible um, because it is filling up quickly. Um, that is all the announcements uh, this morning and now our Ministry of Music. Thank you. 
Today's reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But some shepherds came and drove them away. Moses got up and came to their defense and watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Ruel, he said, how is it that you have come back to so soon today? They said, an Egyptian helped us against the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, where is he? Why did you leave the man? Invite him to break bread. Moses agreed to stay with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah in marriage. She bore a son, and he named him Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, choir, for that beautiful anthem as well, sung in Welsh by Welsh composer Ro uh, Robert Arwen. Our, let's stand again and sing together our hymn of preparation number 671, I Need Thee Every Hour. <laughs>
Let us pray. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. My wife, Jaylin, saw the Prince of Egypt movie with her young nephew. And when the burning bush scene began, Jaylin said out loud, Oh, the burning bush. She's always been a little too loud for my taste in movie theaters. And her nephew whipped his head around and looked at her and said, Aunt Jaylin, you said you hadn't seen this movie before. Didn't know the story was a little older than Disney, a little older than Charlton Heston even. But the story you heard for today doesn't tend to show up in Hollywood portrayals of Moses. It doesn't come up in children's Bibles or in Sunday school lessons. This is the first Sunday of Lent, the first of six Sundays where we repent of our sins and and prepare for the cross. Lent is not just about giving up cussing or chocolate, something pious or trivial. Lent is about aligning our lives with God's way. Aligning our lives with God's way. It's what the whole Christian life is about. I've heard of whole churches that give up alcohol collectively for Lent and then pool the money in a spirits fund. Get it? Spirits fund. And then give it to something that helps against the damage often done by alcohol like Mothers Against Drunk Driving or Alcoholics Anonymous. Lent is the church's way of tricking us all into greater faithfulness. And our point of focus for this Sunday is anger. The great Frederick Buechner gives us this image for anger. It's in your order of service on page 10, if you'd like to read along. Here goes. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll your tongue over the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. There are other so-called deadly sins, as the church listed them in the Middle Ages, pride, greed, envy, lust, gluttony, sloth. Our age almost defines those things as virtues. (laughs) We got to swim upstream on this stuff. But it is a good list of some of the things that corrode our inner life and hollow us out from the inside. Anger is especially good at this. Have you ever been standing in line or waiting in traffic or lying in bed and you think of the perfect zinger response to someone who insulted you decades ago? That's anger worming its way through our imagination, taking up space where it shouldn't be. Someone wise said bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. And Moses shows us a flash of anger in this story. It's not the last time that his anger will get him in trouble. Now, this is Moses' first story where he's all grown up, the first one where he shows agency. Up until now, things happened to Moses, like getting born during a genocide, like being delivered in a basket, like being raised in a palace. But now, Moses strides onto the scene And he's an actor in the play, not just a prop. Now Moses goes out and looks, and he sees, really sees what's going on. He sees this Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. He didn't have to do this. What it means to grow up in luxury in a palace is you don't have to go out. You don't have to see. You don't have to notice the suffering that props up your lifestyle. So Moses chooses to do a thing he could have easily avoided, and he's to be commended for that. Most of us don't see the people who provide our food, or make our clothes, or fight our wars, or police our streets, or empty our garbage. We are all so dependent 
on other people. But Moses sees and he responds to this injustice. Now, some of the rabbis say it wasn't until this moment that Moses even remembered he was an Israelite. But as he sees his fellow being beaten, he realizes who he is. This man is him. He is them. And injustice being done to this person is being done to all humanity. So Moses acts for justice. He intervenes. He strikes, the text says. Just for the record, the sound is snow coming off the roof in the sun. It's not that God's necessarily angry at something you or I have done, but it is impressive. The first thing to say is that not all anger is bad. To be angry at an injustice is a good thing. The church speaks of that as righteous anger. Anyone who's visited a former Nazi death camp site and not been angry, I worry about your soul. There are many such places of misery around the world. In Rwanda, in the U.S. South, where I'm from, in Cambodia, we're making new ones in Ukraine now. These places show that we humans do horrible things to one another, and they are sites of God's anger. God sees and is just and is angry. But that's just at the macro scale. It's also true in households. God is also angry at domestic abuse, child abuse. Anytime a stronger takes out anger on a weaker. So Moses is right to be angry. God is angry with Pharaoh for enslaving and mistreating the Israelites. Jesus gets angry too. But Moses sees gets angry, and then his anger gets the best of him. He kills the Egyptian. Now, there are presumably many things short of this Moses could have done. He could have intervened. He could have appealed to his adopted grandfather, Pharaoh. Moses is a prince in Egypt. He has power. Might not have worked, but he could have tried, and it wouldn't have been murder. The very first story we get of Moses As a person in his own right, he's committing a murder. A spur of the moment, unreflective spasm of violence. And he hides the Egyptian's body in the sand. Now maybe his lawyer could have gotten him off on a manslaughter plea, but let's be clear, this is unlawful killing. I often say that several of my best friends are murderers. King David, St. Paul. Moses. Brian Stevenson, a lawyer in the U.S., relitigates cases, capital cases where race has been a factor, and often determines that someone is in jail or even about to be executed who's the wrong person. And he says this about capital punishment, no one should be reduced to the worst thing we've ever done. No one. The next day, Moses goes out again. He's clearly not nervous, or he'd be hiding himself, but he struts out into public, and he sees a fight between two Hebrews. Now, these slaves may have internalized the hatred against them from the Egyptians and taken it out on one another. And one of them asks Moses, do you mean to kill us the way you did the Egyptian? The thing is known, and Moses has to flee. Now, how is the thing known? Did the Israelite who Moses stood up for tell on him? We don't know. The man who asks the accusing question also says this, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Uh, God did that, actually. This is a glimpse of what it will be like for Moses and the people in the wilderness. They'll murmur and grumble and complain because that's what we do. As human beings, the relationship will be contentious. Moses will often say to God, hey, these people are ready to murder me, to hide me in the sand the way I did to the Egyptian. In other words, the Hebrews are no better than the Egyptians. The Egyptians are no worse than the Hebrews. We're all made of the same frail stuff. 
One English preacher in the 16th century saw a line of men going to the gallows to hang, and he said, there, but for the grace of God, go I. I'm no better than them. My life could have ended up at the end of a noose just as well. Now, the rabbis point out that Moses has a bit of an anger problem. It flashes out at key moments in his life. Later, when the people are grumbling with thirst in the wilderness, God says, speak to the rock and it'll give water. Moses doesn't do it. He whacks the rock twice with his staff. And water comes and the people drink, but God is unhappy. Moses, why did you strike violently when I told you to speak gently? So Moses won't get to see the promised land or lead the people there. It seems like a harsh punishment, except this is Moses' major flaw, his anger. And it just makes me wonder what your flaw is or mine. I find that for most of us human beings, what's good about us and what's flawed about us are really close to one another. They're often the very same thing. Moses can't look away from injustice. And he flashes out with anger. Those are very close to one another. Anger is high on my list, probably on lots of yours. I mentioned a prayer last week from an early monk. A monk comes to see him and says, Brother, I need your help getting back at a brother who has hurt me. The monk says, Let us pray. Oh God, we have no further need of you, for we can take revenge all by ourselves. And the monk says, Oh, you're right. I won't hold a grudge. To be angry is to put ourselves in the position of God, to try and sort out what's right and what's wrong all by ourselves and make it right like Moses does. But the judgment seat is already occupied. There's only room for one. But it's really hard to overcome our anger, especially the more you've been hurt. So in another early church story, one monk confesses to another, I've been praying for 70 years that God would help me with my temper. 70 years is a long time for one prayer. As they say in the black church, God doesn't always come when you want, but God is always on time. We've been living with the Exodus story for some months now, and we'll continue through Lent and Easter. Now, we're bouncing around a little on the timeline. Last week, we were with Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, we're back in Egypt at the beginning of the story. Lots of you are reading Exodus along with these sermons, and I encourage the rest of you to do the same. It's a good practice for Lent. You'll notice a few things in these stories. One, God is really, really patient with us. More patient, I think, than God should be. God doesn't choose the Israelites because they're particularly good people. They quarrel and fuss and fight, just like God's people have ever since. So we're in good company when we quarrel and fuss and fight. Two, Moses isn't ready yet. He will lead the people to freedom, but first, he has to go into the wilderness himself for 40 years. Only then can he be ready. To lead. Now, for reasons unclear, God waits till the Israelites have been enslaved 400 years before God acts, and then lets Moses mature for 40 more years. 440 years is a long time to wait for a prayer to be answered. I wonder what your ancestors were doing 440 years ago in the year 1583. No idea, right? Exactly. That's a long time to wait. But God does act through Moses for the people. God just takes his sweet time about it. I have no idea why. Now Moses' time in Midian is not wasted. Moses marries a Midianite woman. Zipporah will often be blamed by the Israelites for being from a different race, being from a different religion, looking different than they do. Her father is a priest in Midian who will be helpful to Moses. Now, I love this. 
Israel is not Israel without Midian, its enemy. The Midianites are another religion, another race, another people. Israel will fight them often. There's something about Israel always either fighting with or marrying its neighbors. Just very human that way. Moses, Israel's greatest leader, has his wife from another race and religion. This foreign priest, his father-in-law, blesses Israel, brings gifts to Israel. So God does choose sides, friends. Israel is God's chosen, God's beloved. But Israel is not Israel without Midian. Only with Midian is Israel who God wants it to be. God chooses Israel to bless all the other people. Not so that Israel will think it's better, but so that Israel will serve others. And God draws on gifts from the Midianites to make Israel who she is. And look at how Moses gains this Midianite wife. He advocates for justice, yet again, for the third time in that short passage. The first time for an Israelite against the Egyptian torturer, for the second time between two Israelites, and now for the third time between Midianites fighting over access to a well. Moses' thirst for justice knows no racial, religious, or ethnic bounds. And Moses doesn't lack for courage. Give him that. Discretion, maybe. But courage, no. The girl's father is aghast that they haven't invited this Egyptian home for hospitality. That is, the Midianites are more thankful than the Israelites are. They invite him over, they break bread, they offer a spouse to Moses. This is Israel's own book. And in Israel's own book, she writes down this story that says, our enemies are better than we are. That is strange stuff, y'all. Moses' son is named Gershom, which means stranger in a foreign land. And it reminds me, often people will ask out there who aren't part of our church, oh, you're pastor of a big and famous church. What are the people like there? And they expect I'll say, oh, well, you know, they're snooty country club types. I don't say that. I say they all think the church is for somebody else, not them. They think they got here through some back door, through some accidental way, but the church is really intended for other sorts of people. And that, my friends, can be our superpower. If we all think this church was for someone else and I just happened in and got included. So when people come and see, hey, this church isn't for me, it's for someone else, we can say, that's true for me too. In fact, the only requirement to be a part of this people is to think this people is not for you. <laughs> just like Gershom, strangers in a strange land. Then I say something else. You won't believe how awesome they are. Come and see. They haven't always responded to that invitation yet. Back to our story. What you see here is Moses' growth. This is a portrait of the leader as a young person. First, impetuous with anger, stronger in body than in soul, resulting in bloodshed. And then, intervening more peacefully, less violently, that's progress. Then intervening again in a way that makes for friendship and wedding bells and a new people. I hope for similar progress in all of us, morally and spiritually speaking. Someone jokes that if you're not liberal when you're young, you have no heart. And if you're not conservative when you're old, you have no brain. I don't know about any of that. We all change, hopefully becoming wiser and gentler without giving up our love for justice. But you do know Christians are both liberal and conservative, right? We preserve treasures from antiquity in order to give them away recklessly. We're both things. I hope that crosses up your boundary lines. Someone wise said when asked if Christians were conservative or liberal, I don't know. Jesus is raised from the dead. You figure it out. Equally baffling to all of us. More than that, I hope we can all make spiritual progress like Moses does 
against the violence in our own hearts. I was talking with one of you this week who came to our church via AA that meets in our basement. Now, that's an uncommon road. People in recovery groups often go to those groups because they experience there something they've never experienced before, total lack of judgment, just affirmation. However sober you are or are not, we are glad you're here, and we want to help you get healthy. When they come up the stairs into sanctuaries like this, they often feel judged, even if no one's actually doing the judging. It takes courage to come up those stairs. And what you told me about is one of the 12 steps in recovery. That is, making an exhaustive catalog of your bitterness and anger. Addicts often use substances to dull rage and pain. But once you express everything that makes you angry, once you speak it, once you vomit it out, you feel better. And so you told me, after you had done this for hours, said everything you were angry about, Later that day, you noticed for the first time, you didn't feel like drinking. And that is called progress. There are miracles happening in our basement, friends, just like there are miracles happening in our sanctuary. Now, you've got to be careful with some of this patience thing that I'm telling you about. Those in power often preach patience to those who are unjustly mistreated. Those crushed by injustice aren't into patience. They're hungry for justice now, and they're right to be. Moses saw an injustice, and he was right to do something, right to intervene, just not right to do so with murder. Even so, God uses that sin to make Moses the leader he will be. He will always be a leader with a limp, a mover of masses who's a murderer, someone who could never pretend he was perfect, far from it, but someone God could work through to bring grace to the world. That's all any of us could want. There's a story about St. Francis of Assisi in the Middle Ages. There's a village called Gubbio where a wolf is eating villagers. Francis comes and tell the, tells the villagers, don't worry, I'll talk to the wolf. I talk to animals. I do this sort of thing. The villagers say, no, 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 he's eating people. He'll eat you. And Francis says, it's okay. He finds the wolf and he says, brother wolf, you've been eating people. The wolf nods. You're hungry, aren't you, brother wolf? The wolf nods. So Francis leads the wolf back into the village. The villagers are terrified. Francis says, wait, wait, brother wolf, you're hungry, aren't you? Nods. You won't be eating anybody else, will you? He nods. Villagers, you have food, don't you? They do. If you feed this wolf, he'll protect you. He won't do violence to you. It sounds like the best pious sort of legend, right? Anger comes from lack, from hunger. With care, you can turn anger into friendship. Well, when they were redoing the roads in Gubbio in modern times, they dug up an immaculately carved coffin with a wolf in it. Do with that what you will. Anger can do a lot for you. It's like Fred Beekner says, a fist. A fist can do a lot for you. A fist can fight. A fist can agitate. What a fist can't do is open its hand to hold another or to offer up prayer to God. So let's do that together now, shall we? Let us pray. Gracious God, Drain us of our anger, of everything that rots from within, and fill us instead with your Holy Spirit and all of your mercy. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let us come before God and join our hearts together as we pray for ourselves, for our community, and for our world. God of grace and of hope, we thank you that even when we are distracted and focused on our circumstances, 
on the things we're angry about rather than on you, you walk alongside us and you make your presence known to us and you gently guide us on our way. So often in life, as we walk through difficult situations or as we deal with day-to-day -day matters and frustrations, we forget your promise to always be with us and we forget how much you love us, that you are always there, right beside us. And sometimes it's only in retrospect that we look back and see that you were with us all along. You reveal your presence to us when we are in the wilderness and during stressful times. Help us, O oh God, to fix our eyes on you and on your goodness and not on our limitations. Help us to lean into you and to trust you to be there with us. We pray this morning for those, O oh God, who are feeling overwhelmed and fearful and those who need reassurance that you are with them. Especially this morning, we pray for those who are ill, those who are in hospital, those who are recovering from surgery or medical treatments. We pray for those who are grieving and those who are lonely. And we pray for those who are hungry. We pray for the people in our congregation and in our community who are struggling with addictions and dependencies, as well as those who struggle with depression, anxiety, or overwhelming anger, that they would know that there is hope, and that there is help for them, and that they would know your great peace in their lives. Father, with humble and grateful hearts, we lift up these prayers spoken aloud, as well as all of the silent prayers of our hearts, and we offer them to you in trust, in hope, and in the powerful name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, friends, as uh, Reverend Jason mentioned, there is snow and ice falling off the roof today, and so in a few minutes we'll, all, we'll be leaving the church, and I would just remind you to be cautious as you're going out uh, to the parking lot that uh, you move away from the building <laughs> and into the parking lot quickly uh, and not linger too close to the building. Now let us continue to worship God as we present and dedicate our offering. Good morning. <laughs> For the past several weeks during the month of Black History Month, we've taken a brief trip through the rich history of black choral music, mainly focusing on the spiritual and delving deeper into its ties and into its origins in slavery, used as a tool to navigate the conditions and the day-to-day -day existence of the slaves and also to actualize their path to freedom. While the spiritual is a significant part of the black choral tradition, it is also important to understand that black composers have and continue to occupy a significant place in shaping and contributing to the Western choral tradition as well. Today we'll hear from what's one such of those contributors, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who was referred to as the African Mahler in the eight, late 1800s when he was um, occupying the scene in New York by white musicians. Um, he wrote several string quartets, piano quintets, and of course works for solo instruments in addition to songs for, vo for voice and for choir. Today's selection is his interpretation of Psalm 97, specifically verse 10, O ye that love the Lord. We hope that you enjoy.
friends, I have this blessing for you. God of all grace, take our anger and swallow it up with your mercy. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you.